I'd like to welcome everybody here to our last uh, seminar of the semester from the Department of Geology, Geography and Environmental Studies. I'm Deanna Van Dyke, and we are proud to co-host this seminar with the Calvin University Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens. And so my job is pretty easy today as I will simply introduce Jamie Skillen, a, a good colleague of mine, a professor of environmental studies and director of the Calvin University Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens. And he will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much, Deanna. And thank you, Steve, for coming today. Uh, it's a privilege to introduce Stephen David Johnson. He is a conservation photographer and professor of visual communication arts at Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, that's in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Uh, his remarkable work has appeared widely in conservation publications and journals. Some include Orion, Nature Conservancy Magazine, uh, Ranger Rick, and Virginia Wildlife. Uh, he's also vice president of the Virginia Wilderness Committee and an affiliate of the International League of Conservation Photographers. When Steve takes on a project, he learns his subjects in such detail that if I had the authority, I would grant him honorary degrees in at least herpetology and more broadly natural history. Uh, I don't know if others will quibble. Uh, now I met him almost 30 years ago. And at the time, I think we both had cameras in our hands. Uh, since that time, I sort of switched to an iPhone and take a few selfies. Uh, and in those three decades, Steve uh, earned an MFA at Savannah College of Art and Design and has spent that time in relentless and really creative pursuit of excellence in photography. Uh, I'm pleased to report uh, then that, uh, as you'll see today, his, his work really is quite remarkable. And I would direct you to, if you enjoy the presentation today, I will put in the chat a link to a, a very recent ebook on vernal pools. So you can look up some of the photography that you'll see today. I'll also add that Steve's gonna start with a short video that he made and I'll put a link to that in the chat. So if your connection isn't good and you aren't able to watch it, you'll be able to circle back to that. One last thing I'll add is that uh, we're delighted to co-host this uh, here at the Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens. And after seeing this photography, I hope a number of you will come over to the preserve, Stay, of course, staying on the trails, but come over and see the vernal pools here at the Ecosystem Preserve. So Steve, thanks so much. We look forward to seeing your work and also hearing about what it means not just to be a nature photographer, but a conservation photographer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jamie. So in this presentation, I'll be sharing about this long-term project that I've had exploring vernal pools photographically, and particularly the amphibians that breed in them. Now, this is mostly gonna be from work in Appalachian, Virginia, in the outskirts of Appalachia, uh, but I'm interested in what's going on in Michigan and did a little bit of research Interestingly enough, uh, there's actually a Michigan organization that's going to be licensing some of my images for an upcoming publication. So I'm interested in this from a couple of different perspectives. But to get started today, I did want to show this two minute short film that features my footage from the field and is edited by my filmmaker friend, Alex Wiles.
So would you give you a little bit of background, uh, how I got into this field and what conservation photography means. In 2005, I moved to the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia to take a job teaching photography and digital media here at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg. And probably like many photographers, my primary way of communication, it's visual. So I started keeping a blog and sending images to folks back home. And of course, it was included family images, but they also included images of the natural world and the new areas that I was exploring, new neighbors I was meeting, not just human ones, but turtle neighbors and mink neighbors and predatory snake neighbors. But I soon discovered that, that not everything was well in my new neighborhood. Pollution and runoff were contributing to massive fish kills in the Shenandoah River. And an industrial pipeline development threatened to fragment both the nearby George Washington National Forest and private farmland, posing a risk to rare species in this area. As I learned about these threats, I also got to know the environmental organizations and researchers trying to address these issues. At the same time, I was starting to become familiar with the idea of conservation photography through the great work of the International League of Conservation Photographers, which is based in Washington, DC. So what's conservation photography? Well, some people have described it as nature photography with a mission. I think that's kind of the official ILCP tagline. I've often described it as nature photography plus. It's nature photography plus environmental advocacy and also an eco ecosystems approach. So using your images to help protect the natural world and also understanding that these images aren't just disconnected aesthetic objects, they're documentation of something that's really complex and interrelated. So I'm very interested in behavior, in systems, the relationships that I find in the natural world. Practicing this discipline has become a way of protecting and giving back to the life and the landscapes that sustain me. As a visual and communication arts professor, I want to share with my students the things that matter to me most. I believe teachers are at their best when they share out of their life passions. In 2011, I wrote a grant proposal to help jumpstart a course here at EMU in conservation photography. And these are some of my students out in the field. I followed this up with a year long sabbatical practicing conservation photography in the Cascade Siskiyou Monument of Southern Oregon, uh, which is exactly the place that I met Jamie many years before that. When I returned to Virginia in 2013, I launched a full semester course in conservation photography. Philosophically, I draw on the idea of place-based education. I emphasize how learning to know and love a particular place contrast with the sometimes utilitarian thinking that often surrounds debates about industrial development. When we're out in the forests and streams, Students are able to do the things humans were meant to do, explore, follow up on their natural curiosity, and learn from direct observation. So that all leads me back to, to vernal pools. My interest in conservation and conservation education led to affiliations with groups like the Virginia Herpetological Society and nonprofit groups like Wild Virginia and Virginia Wilderness Committee. Through field excursions with these organizations, I learned that the Central and Southern Appalachians are a biodiversity hotspot for salamanders, with more than 50 species in Virginia alone. After attending a field trip led by Virginia vernal pools expert, Michael Hazlett, I wanted to learn more about the fascinating life cycles of the creatures that exist just below the surface of these temporary ponds. Creatures like salamanders, frogs, crustaceans like fairy shrimp. 
That interest led to a multi-year project that continues today. And I'll just mention here that I found that working with scientists is so important. My own background is in visual arts and communication, but going out on trips with scientists, uh, picking their brains, documenting their projects, that's been a huge part of my learning experience and the kind of collaborations that have developed in this project. Over the last decade, I've developed underwater photography techniques to document freshwater environments, such as vernal pools, wetlands, and rivers. And I've been developing a body of natural history photographic work that also intersects with my conservation photography projects. The image you see here on the, the top right, I've been working with the state of Virginia contributing photography for some of their new guides. Uh, the latest one is frogs and toads. Before that, it was salamanders. In early 2021, I partnered with the North American Nature Photography Association to release an ebook about documenting life in these temporary ponds. My friend Mike Hazlett contributed his writing on vernal pool conservation and geology, and has also graciously allowed me to draw on some of that information in this presentation. I think Jamie put the link in here, but you can download the ebook at nampa.org slash handbooks. Nampa is the North American Nature Photography Association. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I was curious to know a bit more about amphibian diversity in, Mich in Michigan. So I looked up the Department of Natural Resources site and I noticed this, that we have a number of shared species. Now, while Virginia has over 50 salamander species, with the ones that M Michigan actually has, there is substantial overlap with some of the species in my study. So you've got Eastern newts, Eastern tiger salamanders, four-toed salamanders, marbled salamanders, redback salamanders, and spotted salamanders. Interestingly, there are some variations between our states in the relative level of um, how common they are. So for example, in Virginia, Eastern tiger salamanders are a state endangered species, but I think they're relatively more common in Michigan. So let's get into it and talk about vernal pool biodiversity. I love exploring vernal pools. On rainy spring nights, the Appalachian forest just nearby where I live starts to wake up. Eastern newts start waddling across the snow. Wood frogs call like quacking ducks. Spotted salamanders spent much of their year underground. At this point, they begin to emerge and migrate to their breeding pools. For herpetologists, one of the most striking things about vernal pool environments is the part they play in the life cycles of several species of salamanders and the Ambystema genus. What are vernal pools? They're basically seasonal ponds. They, they dry up at a certain point. They form from seasonal rains and snow melt. And these temporary bodies of water are ideal environments for egg laying for amphibians because they are free from most predator fish. So it's their ephemeral nature that keeps them free of fish. These environments are quite diverse in makeup. They include pristine natural environments with rare species like this large sinkhole pond in Maple Flats in the George Washington National Forest of Virginia. I think Michigan vernal pool environments are probably a bit different. Uh, the small amount of research I did sounds like there's a lot more of a glaciated environment. So you're probably getting vernal pools uh, as, as leftovers from that glacial period. Here we've got a lot of limestone and karst and those form sinkhole ponds, some of the larger ponds that we have. Other ponds are quite small. There are ponds that I document like this one where I can literally stand on that rock and reach across the pool to the other side. Others can range up to a few acres. Human-made wildlife waterholes can also function like vernal pools to some degree, supporting species like spotted and Jefferson salamanders. However, true natural vernal pools 
ones that actually are ephemeral or even reconstructed vernal pools may support higher biodiversity. Vernal pool and bistema salamanders, sometimes known collectively as mole salamanders, spend much of the year underground, emerging for breeding events that are usually triggered by rain in the fall or could be winter or spring, depending on their species. After these breeding events, these kind of luminous egg clusters will often dot the vernal pool environment. What you're seeing here are spotted salamander eggs. These are all from one species. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about why they appear so different with some of them cloudy and some of them more clear. Since about 2012, I've been using an underwater camera to document life below the surface of vernal pools. And that's some of the work we'll get into in more detail now. So we're gonna talk in this first section about obligate amphibians. These are creatures that require vernal pools for completing their life cycle, sometimes known as indicator species. As I said before, because vernal pools are temporary, they usually don't support fish. And it's this feature that allows obligate species such as spotted salamanders to breed in these pools in relative safety. Type of obligate species is a marbled salamander, which I believe you have in Michigan. In Virginia, they are somewhat unusual in that they are fall breeders. On rainy autumn evenings, for me, that's usually sometime mid October. These really elegant monochromatic salamanders emerge from underground and start to trek towards the edges of depressions that will eventually fill to become vernal pools. After breeding, marbled salamanders lay their eggs beneath logs or leaves in these depressions. And if you look really carefully, you'll, you'll see this is moved from a still image to a video. This is often how I'll encounter salamanders in the woods. Uh, sometimes they'll have a freeze reaction and you can watch carefully and see them breathing. The adults after breeding will eventually return underground. Female spotted salamanders, like the one you see on the left, display a silvery gray hue, while males have bands that are nearly white. I think it's really fascinating to see a creature with such stark zebra-like patterns among the earth tones of the forest floor. I'm always startled when I see it. When the ponds fill, because they're fall breeders, marbled salamander larvae are the first salamanders on the scene. And that's what you're seeing here. Salamander larva, a marbled with its kind of fringy gills. And in this next short video, you'll see one of these larva uh, preying on copepods. So they feast on copepods, fairy shrimp, even other smaller salamander larvae that begin their development later in the season. So in this video, those tiny orange creatures are copepods. And Daphnia and fairy shrimp also appear in this scene. Fairy shrimp are a type of crustacean that are also obligate species of vernal pools. Their eggs dry out when the pools lose water and can be transported when ducks eat them. And you can see that further in this description by Mike Hazlett, who's really the vernal pools expert for the state of Virginia. Fascinating creatures, they swim upside down, as you can see here. What you're seeing in this top one, those are claspers that the male uses during breeding. In this image, a marbled salamander larva is preying on a fairy shrimp. Sometimes I'll find that fairy shrimp and copepods are attracted to my lights when I'm doing uh, underwater videography at night and will swarm in clouds around me. Sometimes I even have to take a break just to let those clouds disperse so I can see anything else. 
here I am kind of looking through one of these clouds of fairy shrimp and copepods, and you see a marbled salamander larva in the middle with a copepod, this tiny crustacean right here. One of the things I did over the last year when I had the sabbatical project is I developed a, a system for doing really, really ultra macro photography. So getting down into some of the tiniest creatures that are only millimeters long. So as you can see, even with macro photography here, it's really hard to see what this copepod looks like. And for many years, this is how I experienced them as these little orange blobs. But now with a new setup, I've been able to photograph using underwater strobes, this ultra macro view of copepods in C2, so in the field. Even down to seeing details like this one blue eye that it has in the center. And I'll say at this point, if, uh, if anybody has any questions or wants any clarification on, along the way, please feel free to jump in. Uh, put questions in the chat. I'll answer questions at the end too, but I'm glad to make this interactive as you have thoughts. This is a uh, marbled salamander that's grown a, a little bit larger. One of the things that I find incredibly helpful about macro photography is there are things I learn after the fact. So sometimes it can be difficult in the moment to do things like distinguish IDs, but taking two high resolution images and then putting them side by side later on, I can start to notice details that I wouldn't see otherwise, like the dark coppery eyes and the very distinct row of whitish spots on the marbled salamander larva at the left, as opposed to the spotted salamander larva that you see at the right, whose eyes look a little bit different, it has much less distinct spotting, and the gills are a bit different also. Eventually, the marbled larvae emerge from the pond as juveniles, looking a lot like smaller versions of the adults. Then they'll continue on with their life cycle, eventually going underground. Another obligate species, and I'll, I'll make the uh, slight disclaimer here that they're an obligate species regionally for us in that in our area, they rely on vernal pools. In some other places, this may be the case in Michigan, they might be described as facultative species because they can breed in other environments such as wetlands. One of the interesting things about tiger salamanders is you find them really early in the season. So after these fall breeders, there's a bit of a gap and then December through February in Virginia is where you find Eastern tiger salamanders. So when I'm looking for them, sometimes it's literally Christmas time. I'm out on Christmas break from school, standing in icy cold water, dipping my hands under the water, looking for these, what are quite elusive creatures in Virginia. In Virginia, tiger salamanders are under threat from wetlands development but there's a few remnant populations that hold on. While tiger salamanders are common in some parts of the country, the Eastern species or the Eastern uh, regional species can be scarce in some states. And Eastern tiger salamanders are a state endangered species here in Virginia. And that actually gets into one of the conservation stories. So I started this off with conservation photography. And this project, the Vernal Pools Project, in many ways has been a large natural history project, but it's intersected with my conservation photography work along the way. So one of the big issues that I mentioned early on was, a, was an industrial pipeline that was going to uh, come through the national forest. And it turns out, that it was also going to go onto private land that really didn't have much of any protection. The pipeline right away was going to go right next to one of these ponds within about 500 feet. So part of my work became documenting uh, that pond, showing that there were still eggs there, communicating with state agencies as they did their own surveys, 
And eventually some of that work has ended up in various conservation photography documentation projects that I've done. Ambistema tigrinum are the largest of the mole salamanders. They're pretty impressive when you see them, kind of muscular with these bright speckled eyes, mottled patterns, strongly keeled tail. Most Eastern tiger salamanders in Virginia are coastal, but there's this tiny relictual population near the Blue Ridge Mountains that's actually part of an ancient group that dates back to the Pleistocene. Another species, and this is when you don't have a fish again, they're super fascinating. In the early spring, Jefferson salamanders emerge from their underground forest refuges and travel to vernal pools for breeding events. These are actually images by my good friend, David Huth, also a conservation photographer who's been doing some work on vernal pools. In this case, he's working with a water tank. So these are not in situ images, but working with a water tank and this white background to do locomotion studies. Here comparing two different types of ambistema salamanders, spotted salamanders, which you see in the top left, and then on the top right, a Jefferson salamander. You notice the very grayish coloration ever since. They're basically unmarked, maybe with a few spots and speckles. They have the best toes in the business. Females lay their eggs in oblong clusters, often attached to stems below the surface of the pools. One of the fascinating things about watching these ambistema salamanders develop is you can typically see through their egg masses. So if you go back to the same location over time, you can actually see the embryos start to divide and develop in successive stages through their transparent egg capsules. So here's an ultra macro image of a Jefferson salamander embryo development. And again, using these kind of techniques with photography can help with assessing ID. For example, a spotted salamander egg is on the left and shows a much larger capsular chamber surrounding the embryo as compared with the Jefferson salamander egg that you see on the right. The eggs continue to develop and eventually the larvae emerge with golden eyes. I'm going to do a little bit of a case study here with spotted salamanders. So February through April is spotted salamander season. These are really the, the icons of the, the vernal pool world with their yellow polka dotted skins. Here's a close up of one underwater during a breeding event. And during these breeding events, males deposit spermatophores on the bottom of the pools, which the female will pick up. So that's where the DNA is coming from. So you're seeing those all scattered over the surface of the vernal pool. Here's one close up. This is another ultra macro image. What you're seeing on the left there, that's actually a, a tiny copepod. Uh, so you can see how small they can get in relationship to something that's already small, like a spermatophore. This is one of the images that I was so excited about during the sabbatical project finally getting a couple of images of female spotted salamanders depositing their eggs. This is one of the rare occasions where my wife was out with me in the field. She has this cell phone video of me just grinning from ear to ear. I was so excited seeing this. These spotted salamander egg masses often really stand out from their background. They can be positively luminous. In this image, we're seeing multiple egg masses just below the surface of a small vernal pool in the George Washington National Forest. Now these eggs, uh, they're not just kind of 
standing there in their environment untouched. There are lots of creatures that are very interested in either preying on them or preying on things like algae that develop around them. So here we've got wood frog tadpoles swarming around these spotted salamander eggs in a vernal pool. They can be really otherworldly in their abstract beauty. Look like tiny worlds. Few other creatures that prey on them, Eastern newts. This was almost like a shark feeding frenzy that I observed. Wood frog tadpoles. Even green hydra make use of the surfaces of spotted salamander egg masses. They look kind of like uh, little, like tiny anemones. These freshwater hydras will latch onto the surface where they feed on other minuscule creatures. There's even recent research that has shown that while hydras may be killed, they do not die of old age. Uh, there's an interesting podcast about this. All sorts of fascinating scientific facts end up intersecting with this sort of documentation work. This is a caddisfly larva. It's preying on the edge of the spotted salamander egg mass. So predator and prey have really co-evolved to take full advantage of these ephemeral ponds. As a spotted salamander embryo develops inside of an individual egg, one of the really interesting things is that photosynthetic algae also grow inside the egg. And this gradually alters the color balance to this sort of vibrant yellow green. There's a researcher in Pennsylvania, Ryan Kearney, who's discovered that the algae even grow inside the living cells of the embryo, which is a first discovery for a vertebrate species. So understanding the science of this changes what you perceive. Those bright green shades infusing the embryos, they're not just visually striking, they're actually an indication of a kind of symbiosis. In fact, just uh, in the last day, I saw this article from Penn State that was looking at some of the science behind this. So you may have noticed before that some of these spotted salamander eggs are clear, others are opaque, like the one you see here on the left. There are scientists who are trying to figure out why this is happening, because it seems to be in any given pond, there's kind of a, a ratio between these, which can shift over time. One theory I've heard for why this is happening is that the clear ones are better for algae development, which may assist with oxygen intake, whereas the opaque may be better for resisting predation. But there's a lot of further studies that need to be done on this. With periodic trips to a vernal pool, you may encounter larvae just about ready to hatch. And even larvae in the process of leaving the egg capsule. And here they are after hatching. Those were most of the, uh, the most common types of species that I see in these projects. Last year, I was able to document a maybe salamander for the first time. I love their name. I traveled up and met with our state herpetologist and explored a pond complex that was new to me. Only have a few images at this point. COVID started to cut into this project and I wasn't able to stay in a hotel any longer, but I hope to return to this coastal area of Virginia to see a really different sort of species. Okay, I'm gonna wrap things up with a section on frogs. And I think by 4.15, we're gonna take some questions. So I'll go through these somewhat rapidly. So what you're hearing are the sounds of wood frogs. And one of my favorite vernal pools about 25 minutes from where I'm sitting right now at EMU. This phone get, video gives you kind of a sense of a quack-like call. Wood frogs are uh, coming out pretty early in the season. This 
image shows that you can see them on snow. They can freeze nearly solid in the winter with a kind of natural antifreeze that keeps their internal organs from crystallizing. Wood frogs are explosive breeders, sometimes filling up an entire section of a pond with thousands upon thousands of eggs. I found this wood frog resting on a spotted salamander egg mass in a vernal pool. It seemed very uninterested in me and allowed me to approach quite close. It looked like it was just kind of resting on a cloud. As wood frog tadpoles hatch, they nibble at algae covering the egg masses they've left behind before turning their appetites to nearby spotted salamander eggs. Over the course of months, I've observed hungry wood frog tadpoles scouring a small pool down to the bare rock. From above the surface, wood frog tadpoles can look small, dark, and nondescript. But when viewed with a light at close range, the intricate golden filigree pattern of their skin becomes apparent. Okay, so that was uh, kind of the end of the obligate section with wood frogs. Let's talk a little bit about facultative species. These are species that use vernal pools to breed or hunt, but do not require them. So they may breed in other places like permanent ponds and river shallows. These include creatures like Eastern newts, which are a ubiquitous presence, presence in Appalachian forests. Their skin contains toxins that make them unpalatable to predators, including fish. There's another one of those white background studies by my friend Dave Huth. They can live in permanent ponds, rivers, vernal pools. Here you're seeing uh, their limb position while they're swimming. They also have a fascinating life cycle. So this is their courtship behavior. You'll see males put the female in this sort of weird headlock as they're courting. Their eggs hatch into aquatic larvae. But if the conditions are right, these newts can enter a terrestrial stage in which they transform into bright orange round-tailed red Fs, EFT. The orange skin signals toxicity to predators. As a result, these red Fs can be seen wandering around the forest during the day when other salamanders are safely tucked away under cover objects. My friend Dave studied the dorsal spot patterns in red Fs in Western New York and found that the average was nine spots. Another kind of photographic documentation that can contribute to the science. Other facultative species include four-toed salamanders, that live in mossy wetlands and the edges of vernal pools. Here, females deposit eggs in the moss and the embryos develop in this moist, but still terrestrial environment. If you turn them over, they've got these bright white bellies punctuated with dark spots, making them pretty easy to distinguish and some facultative frogs. So spring peepers are common and loud in the East. It can be really frustrating to go out in the field and be surrounded by hundreds of them. And it can take a really long time to even find one of them because they're so small and earth toned, kind of this cryptic coloring. The piercing call is a sure sign of spring in the Eastern US. In the video that follows, you're gonna hear one beginning to call, and then I'll show you a video where hundreds are calling. It was an experience like no other. It felt electric in my body to hear so many of these things calling at once. And the second video. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of them here. Last time I went, I actually took lawnmower headphones and put them on because I felt like I was damaging my hearing. Okay, I see there's a chat that came in. Ah, Megan likes the egg photos. Thanks, Megan. Some other facultative frog species include northern cricket frogs, again, with cryptic coloring. It helps them blend in with leaves and moss. While I might not spot them immediately, they dart out of the way, sometimes dozens of them as I'm walking along the edge 
of a vernal pool. And some fairly common species, green, fo green frogs and bullfrogs. Green frogs are summer breeders, and the male's call is this really distinctive banjo-like twang. While green frogs might look similar to bullfrogs at first, they've got a different sort of dorsolateral ridge that green, with green frogs extends almost to the back legs and bullfrogs, this ridge ends just beyond the tympanum. The bullfrog is the largest frog species in North America. They're native to the Eastern United States, but were introduced to the American West where they're now considered invasive. My daughter Maggie actually built a pond for us, which has become this great green frog habitat and is keeping a naturalist notebook. We're getting to know these frogs as individuals. She's got names for each one of them and checks on in on them every day. American toads breed in vernal pools, also rivers, permanent ponds, and even puddles. In our backyard pond, the high-pitched trilling of male toads competing to breed can be heard through much of the spring. I just love the way you can actually see that frequency be made visible in this video. Male toads like the one seen amplexing a female in this riverine environment are much smaller than females. Their eggs are quite different, kind of looking like this kind of spaghetti. Okay, the next few slides, I'm gonna go through relatively quickly because we're reaching some Q&A time. So we've seen a few invertebrates already, which include crustaceans like fairy shrimp, but also really tiny crustaceans like seed shrimp, here photographed in front of a single wood frog egg, or tiny, tiny water fleas or Daphnia, named after the mythological nymph Daphne. It's tiny jewel-like creatures. There are plenty of insects too that make vernal pools their home and complete their life cycles there and often are voracious predators, sometimes taking tadpoles. I've seen water beetles do that. If you're interested in knowing more about this project, you can go to nampa.org slash handbooks or my own website. You can download the ebook for free, which is where a lot of this information is coming from. I also have a section in this book about tips for underwater photography in vernal pools, including how to disinfect gear or links to that, that process, camera equipment, lighting, et cetera. In the book, you'll also find an afterword about vernal pool conservation and some of the issues, including climate change, development, different types of conservation strategies, as well as resources, websites you can go to, research notes. I included this too, uh, just here at the end. There's actually a great Michigan free vernal pool PDF that you can get that is all about this territory in your own home state. So if you're interested in knowing more, maybe you wanna screenshot that page and uh, it's about 26 pages. And I'll end things there and take some questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, for, uh, for leading us through that topic. And I'll just remind our audience that um, you can put questions into uh, the chat or you can um, just ask them directly. Um, Stephen, I'm not sure if you want to maybe unshare your screen so that you can see um, sure. people on video if they've got a question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and, and either you or I could uh, repeat the questions that you're seeing in the chat. So if other people aren't looking at the chat, they know mm -hmm. what the, the question is and then your answer. Um, so I'm sure, I'm happy that. to do that. Okay, go ahead. 
So Virginia says, was the pipeline stopped permanently or is it still a battle? That's a great question. So the particular pipeline that I was working on, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, was stopped permanently. Uh, and that just happened oh, about a year ago. Uh, that was a long, a long battle. There's another pipeline a couple hours south of us called the Mountain Valley Pipeline. That's still an ongoing, ongoing battle. But that was a huge coalition. Um, really brought people together across the political spectrum, people who are interested in environmental advocacy, um, private land advocates, environmentalists. It was really interesting to see that group come together. Megan says, are your photos available for conservation education for kids? Um, yes, in, in several different ways. I, I certainly license images. Uh, I work with Ranger Rick quite a bit. That was a magazine that I grew up with and I'm really glad to make those images uh, part of that magazine. I've worked on several different children's books with the um, National Science Teachers Association. It's called The Next Time You See series. Uh, I've done talks at my local church, um, been out in the field with kids. So yeah, there's several different ways. Based on your experience in Appalachia, have you encountered the negative effects of mountaintop removal coal mining in your projects? So the area that I'm in, in the Shenandoah Valley, is really kind of right at the edge of Appalachia. And so we're not in coal mining territory, but I have been on assignment for some projects that do get into the effects of mountaintop removal. Uh, I did a project for the Nature Conservancy about a year and a half or so ago that involved mountaintop removal. And yes, I mean, of course, it's had a, it's had a huge environmental impact. Uh, part of what I was document, documenting there too was the effort to try to reclaim some of that land, um, which may not be great for salamanders anymore, um, but they're trying to do some work with introducing elk uh, and other types of species there. But yeah, there's been large parts of Appalachia that have been, been devastated by mountaintop removal. Virginia said, thank you for she, those of us who don't get to see the goodies in person. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, would you explain some of the lighting techniques you use? Yeah, absolutely. So for the still photography, a lot of the work I'm doing is at night uh, because that's when breeding happens. So typically I'm using a type of underwater video light for kind of general illumination so I can see what I'm doing and can focus. But then more specifically, I'm using two underwater strobes. So those strobes, I've got kind of oriented in space, sometimes up here a little bit, looking down at the lens, sometimes a little bit closer for macro subjects. I, uh, I do a lot of experimentation with studio lighting in my office. And here, I've got this on my desk. Uh, I put it in front of me, maybe you can see it. <laughs> this little uh, figure of Boba Fett. I use Star Wars figures as stand-ins all the time for salamanders and amphibians. And I'll practice lighting setup, setups so that when I go out in the field, sometimes I only have five seconds to make the image and I need to be kind of right on it. So uh, I explain a little bit of that in the PDF that you can download to the ebook. Um, but I'm glad to, to answer any more questions. I was fascinated to start thinking about as you were talking about the relationship between um, science and the conservation photography and you introduced yourself as um, being in communications, but you obviously know a lot about the science because you've been observing it uh, so much and and photo documenting it and so um, is there a point where you start to say that you're both a scientist and a communicator or um, you know, it may be coming at it from the other end of things. What about our students who are being trained to be scientists and may want to yeah. move more into your field? So I was just, yeah. Um, yeah. 
so I'll, I'll answer the last part first, which is a lot of the, the best conservation photographers I know have scientific training. That's, that was actually their field. And then they made the switch uh, or, or continued on with their research and also became visual communicators. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm maybe in the minority and, and having come in through the art field. So I've had to learn a lot. I uh, do a lot of reading natural history, um, you know, I, I'm interested widely in science fields. I read physics and paleontology. And, uh, no, I wouldn't call myself a scientist just because I, I just don't have the research training. I, I love the scientific method, but uh, I wouldn't want to call myself something that I, I don't feel like I actually have the training. Maybe a natural historian. I, maybe, I, maybe I take that on. I'm curious, um, oh, what are some of your next projects? Uh, so I think I got so intense into the Vernal Pools project last year that, and then COVID hit, I, I kind of switched gears and I've continued doing some work on that and I'll keep on that project for probably many years, but I've been doing a lot of stuff right in my own backyard. Uh, documenting jumping spiders has been one of my big projects. Uh, life on a spice bush, uh, native species of a plant. I've been documenting all the biodiversity that I see there. I uh, have a long term project that involves documenting life on the Shenandoah River. So, those are a few things that are coming up, but there's actually several publications that are coming up with the Vernal Pools project, which I'm real excited about. Ralph said amphibians are getting hammered all over the world in terms of loss of species. Can you comment on the danger here? Yeah, I mean, I think that danger comes from a few different fronts. Um, development is a huge issue, just loss of wetlands. Another issue is um, amphibian related fungi, fungus disease, uh, like chytrid and B cell. Uh, B cell is a uh, type of infection, fungal infection, that's affected salamanders in Europe, sometimes with great mortality. Uh, it's not known in the wild yet here, but folks in this field are very worried about it. Uh, so thus the advice for disinfecting waders when you go between different watersheds. Uh, the United States also shut down most of the pet trade for salamanders to try to avoid this sort of infection. Climate change is another one. Uh, we're particularly worried in Virginia about some of our endemic species. So one of the reasons that a species can become endemic, just living in one place like a singular mountain or mountain range is because climate's changed in the past. And so you might find that species that used to be able to interbreed eventually kind of get stuck at a certain point on a mountain but with climate change, they may be forced to go further in altitude up the mountain, but there's only so far they can go uh, before there's nowhere else to go. So that is very much a concern for certain species in Virginia. I'm curious, uh, the folks out there in Michigan, uh, do you, any of you have experience with vernal pools? Uh, do you have favorite, favorite amphibians? I'm imagining there's probably a lot of chatter going on in the ecosystem preserve right now. So I'm gonna wait for, for Jamie to give us some of the comments that are coming out there. Yep. All right, here we go. All right, favorite, favorite amphibians, people. Can you hear that okay, Steve? Uh, you might have to repeat it, Jamie. 
All right. Well, I got I got two votes for wood frogs. They're very cool. Well, blue spotted. I am very jealous about that. I've never seen one. Tree frogs. Oh yeah. I, can I tell you a story about tree frogs? Please do. The, they were sort of the the white whale for me. They kind of a common species. I'd hear them for years. I never saw one. Uh, I was up in Shenandoah National Park one day with my wife. We were hiking and I heard one and I realized it was under the women's bathroom. And I was so tempted to crawl into this crawl space under the women's bathroom to try to finally see one. And then I thought better of it. I'm on federal land and how would I possibly explain this to the the officers in the park. So I gave up, but I finally did see one years later. And now we actually have one who's sort of resident in our yard. Eastern spotted salamander. Yes, they are amazing. Blanchard's cricket frog. That is a species uh, that is new to me. Very cool. Thank you for sharing this. And Jamie, it looks like you've got a, a great setup there with the, the fireplace and the uh, open oh, beams. We'll, we'll give you a little tour here. Uh, wonder if the lighting can. How is it going to work? Huh? Man. No, I was going to show you the, uh, I guess the lighting won't work with this camera. Our, this room looks out over a pond. So we're watching wood ducks and Where's our snapping turtle? There's two, Jamie, actually. We have figured out there's two giant snapping turtles. Yeah. Well, maybe there's three. I've identified two that are intrusing. Nate said there's another. Nice. I heard wood, wood ducks and uh, snapping turtles. Well, um, any other questions? Yeah, I'll agree. I'll try to speak up. Um, Stephen, if you could do anything besides what you do now, what would it be? Oh, rock star, definitely. <laughs> well, while we have the audience at the Ecosystem Preserve uh, on the screen, I think this would be a great moment for us to formally thank you, Stephen, for your talk. And we can actually do a real round of applause in the Zoom environment here. So. And we typically stay on a little bit longer if anybody wants to kind of informally talk uh, or ask a few more questions after this. So if you're, you're available, we'll stay on, but I'll uh, formally call this seminar uh, to a close. Thank you so much for bringing your world into our world and also um, both stunning us with the photography and with the information that you did. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Steve, I have a, a question for you about, um, uh, you know, when, when I met you, we were shooting 35 millimeter film. Uh, and now not only is photography digital, but there's so much available, right? So, uh, you know, the, with iPhones, uh, the amount that I can find a picture of almost ever, anything I want online somewhere. Can you just say a little bit about kind of how you see your work in what is kind of a sea of photography. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so, and this is something I talk with my students about a great deal uh, in other classes. I teach courses in things like Photoshop and Photo One and conservation photos, just uh, one course that I teach. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think one of the things that, that I think about with students a lot is just kind of the way images are streamed now and are, we see them through, through an algorithm. Uh, and so, you know, what do images mean in, in that context? 
Uh, this might be somewhat counterintuitive, but sometimes the advice that I give to photography majors is maybe be a little less obsessed with photography. Um, if, you're, if you really care about your subject, um, I think that starts to come through. Uh, it, I try to you know, let students know that what you're really doing is often communicating an encounter. Um, and even if it's not natural history photography, uh, it might be an encounter that you had aesthetically. And if, if you can communicate what you experienced and maybe go into depth with it long term, I think that starts to communicate to an audience. I found personally is, you know, I, I license a lot of these images that even though there are thousands and thousands of images that are free, uh, there are still publications that come to me quite frequently uh, looking to pay me to license images. And I think that's because I've been spending years going into depth, trying to understand the, the behavior and I deeply care about my subject. So they're, they're not one-off images that I, you know, hopefully will get lost in an Instagram feed, but they're part of a body of work that's really kind of life's work. So I, I hope my students take away that, that same sort of message from our program.